Hi, and welcome to my introduction to the crown chakra. So the crown chakra is located on the top of the head and it opens upward, not front or back like the other chakras do. The crown chakra is a chakra which in many traditions is not worked with. It is considered to be beyond the human realm. It is very much about the person's ability to connect with the divine, with ancestors, with higher powers. And as such, these are not considered matters for other people to interfere in, because in any interference with the crown chakra can be an interference with the person's guidance, uh, which they are receiving from the cosmos. Regardless of that, there are certain traditions who do believe you should interfere in the structure of the crown chakra, namely through processes of baptism or some other form of initiation, where the crown chakra actually becomes attuned to one very specific part of the cosmos and is therefore also often blinded or blocked from interacting with other parts of the cosmos. So a process of initiation or baptism can um, create quite a big change in the, in the crown chakra. Uh, personally, I believe more in the traditions which holds that no other person should touch anybody's top of the head because it is very, very private. It is between you and the divine and no man should interfere with that. But nevertheless, it is done a lot. And often it's also done with good intentions and even with good results. Because a person uh, might also go into a very negative feedback loop. So through this chakra I'm connected with lots of other beings, lots of spirits. And if for instance I'm in a not very good place or a not a very good state myself, like in a place where I live there might have been many arguments or there might even have been somebody who's been murdered, uh, or I myself might be in a state of fear or despair or sadness, then through this connection, a lot of harmful energies might come into me and will start guiding my thoughts and my emotions. And I will be caught up in my environment. I will be made a part of an energy flow which is not normal for me or which is not healthy for me. In such cases it can be necessary to perform an initiation or a baptism so that the chakra becomes focused on just this one single energy and only that energy will have access to that human being. But it is ultimately a, a strong limitation um, so it can be compared a little bit to amputating a person's arm to prevent a disease from spreading and ultimately killing the patient. Uh, yes, it may be better to do that than to do nothing, but it is also a very crippling injury for the person's rest of their life. So fortunately not all baptisms are like that. Uh, most baptisms are actually um, performed rather poorly and have no energetic effects. Uh, other baptisms are very open, so they do not ver very specifically specify you will only speak with this power, with this master, with this uh, being, but they more open a person to a large part of the cosmos. Like you will work with the cosmos of light or the tradition of love or wisdom or uh, so that there is still quite a large part of the cosmos which is open to that person after the baptism. And certain baptisms can also be very very narrow, very specific and especially um, I'm sorry to say Protestant baptisms uh, may be this way because they will block any contact with nature beings, they will block contact even with saints and angels who are considered to be wrong 
to communicate with because the person should only communicate with the divine itself or with Jesus Christ. But for many people this is too big a step to take from nothing to talking with the Absolute. Many people need to develop their chakras, to develop their energy bodies and grow slowly towards communicating with the Absolute. And if you take away the access to the ladder, then people cannot reach the top floor. And unfortunately this is the effect of many baptisms that the ladder is removed and the person is trying to reach the top floor but they can no longer get up there. So be aware of that before you do any baptism. The good news is also that these changes they can be reversed. Um, it is best if they are reversed of course by a power which has the proper authority. So if the same priest or priestess which performed the initiation would also remove the initiation because then there is no real conflict. Um, unfortunately people who can perform energetically effective initiations usually also have quite some authority, they have quite some position within that organization or within that religion. So it can be rather tricky to trump that, to get a higher, high enough station to remove such a blockage without any real conflict starting to emerge. And the conflicts here can be rather large. These conflicts can escalate rather quickly because um, the tradition which the person is a part of will protect its members from intrusion, from being bothered from being led astray, even if they want to be led astray. And if the tradition is more light, they tend to respect the person's freedom, their own choice, their ability to determine how their own lives will evolve. And people will just step into the background and keep on counseling the person whenever the person is opening open to it, but they won't actively oppose any move the person is making. If the tradition is however more dark, then there will be a strong opposition to any interference and the person trying to heal a, a crown chakra might find themselves being attacked by various spirits or even uh, magical groups or uh, magicians of that tradition who consider you, be, you to be a threat to, uh, to their group or at least to a member of their group. Because especially in the darker uh, traditions, many uh, of those traditions gain power from membership. So it is kind of like uh, a mafia thing. They, um, the mafia has money and wealth and power because they take it from, for instance, the shopkeepers who have to pay protection money, but at the same time they're taking care that there is no crime, there is no other untoward things happening which would harm these shopkeepers. And it's the same with the dark tradition. They gain power from its members and they also protect their members at the same time. And this also makes it very hard to break free out of such a tradition because without the group you will again be very vulnerable. Um, so many people don't want to leave the group. They will just pay their taxes and in exchange they will have some sense of security even though they're being uh, used by parasites. But at least they're not parasites who know their limits. They won't destroy you because then you will have no more purpose to them. And most groups are wise enough to think of people as long-term investments even for several lifetimes. So they tend to uphold more or less their deals with the people. So there is also, as I said, some danger involved in trying to repair uh, such a chakra which has been attuned much more narrowly than it normally would be. 
one of the important connections uh, for the third, uh, for the crown chakra, is to a person's personal guides, to their power animals, and also to their dreams. So if these levels of the chakra are not functioning well, then the person is really missing out on quite a bit. So let's go over these things one by one. Uh, the dream connection um, can lead to both a personal dream space, where people just live out their, their experiences, their fantasies, and in a way they're looking in the mirror because they create their own dreams out of their experiences. It can also link to a more collective dream space where you go into parts of the astral where you can for instance visit egregores or visit other people or go in other people's dreams to send the messages or telepathically communicate with them. So this is an important area to keep free. If the connection to the dream space is blocked, then basically the person will rehash their memories in their brain, but there will be a lot less um, freedom of interaction and also less ability of other powers to give messages through dreams, to put elements in dreams, to help a person, to. Uh, make a person grow or have experiences which they could not otherwise have in their physical lives. So there's a lot of wealth of experience which is being lost if the dream space is somehow being blocked or twisted. Another blockage which happens um, actually a lot more than blockages to the dream space is the blockage of contact with the person's guides. Um, people are often taught that um, to hear voices or to see things is a sign of insanity and the best thing you can do is try to ignore it or to not to talk about it or try to forget about it and that it even happened. And um, guides actually need to interface with their human. They need to be able to guide their human to get messages across in the form of images, in the form of premonitions, in the form of memories, uh, sometimes words or sentences or even just movements of the body like look here, look at that and then by a small intervention the guide is trying to switch the path the person is on. If the contact with guides is blocked then the person is more or less left in the dark most people do not have an understanding of their life's purpose. They don't have an understanding of what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to go. And the guides are there because they can see the blueprint, the map, what you are exposed to experience in your life. And they can see the opportunities of experiencing those things. And without your guides, you will miss a lot more opportunities than with your guides. So it is not that you won't develop yourself spiritually, but um, there will be simply a lot more missed opportunities. So the process of developing yourself will move along a lot slower. Not so much when you're really devoting yourself to your spiritual development and you have a regime of exercise, but rather the occasional chances which you get of talking to the right person, reading the right book, finding the right article, hearing the right words, um, spoken not even to you directly but maybe in a movie or in some conversation which you're passing on the street. All these things can hold messages, can hold value for you, which is being deprived if the guides have been blocked out. So the power animals I mentioned separately, they are in a way uh, a class of guides, but they're not there so much to um, show you all the opportunities. Um, they're more there to have you do things in your way, to use your power, your talent, your strength, to become self-aware of your influence upon the world, your possibilities within the world to step beyond all your imposed or self-imposed limits and to gain 
your full potential and to do it in a way which is very natural for you rather than in a very artificial or forced manner. So they are not there so much to push you forward into unknown territory, but rather to help you to strengthen your foundation, your self-awareness, your confidence, and also your intuitive knowledge. Uh, because we've all been healing our own energy bodies for many, many lifetimes. So we are all healers. We just don't know it yet. We've also been attuning to all the energies around us not just for our current lifetime, but for many lifetimes. So we can read energies, but all these things tend to have been repressed below the surface because we pay attention to other things. And our power animals exist to rise, to help us lift these things to a conscious level, to a level where we can work with them actively instead of only subconsciously. A power animal usually comes to you when the time is right. And this is usually after your personality has stabilized itself, which for women is usually around their 30s, which for men is around their 40s. And once the personality is stable, then power is no longer so much of a problem. Because the person knows who they are, what they are, how they want to act, what is right, what is wrong and they're no longer twisted or seduced by the power as much as they would be if when they would get it when they were young because power can be seen as a solution to every problem if you apply enough power to it you can force things to happen but this is not the correct way we're not here to force things to be our way we're here to learn and learning is done through adaptation and if you force things into a perfect form you never have to adapt, you have, never have to learn and your entire life is wasted by having the power. So first we need to learn to be flexible, to be willing to make mistakes, to be willing to work on ourselves. And once we have this pattern of working on ourselves, of improving ourselves, then we can be given more power and more tools. Um, and hopefully that power and tools won't make us lazy and that we, so that we will stop developing ourselves and stop learning and working on ourselves. Now this is always a tricky thing and it's usually the power animals who make the decision when to start working with that person's talent. I'm not in favor of one of the practices which is often done within modern shamanism of introducing a person to their power animals or to their guides without the guide or the power animal initiating it. Um, if I have a client and the power animal or the guides are asking me to yeah, establish a contact with their client, I will do so. But if the client is just asking me, like, I would like to know more about my guides or my power animals, I usually try to stay a little bit in the background and tell people, well, if you're interested, do a course or whatever, or read something about it. But I'm not in favor of serving a person's ego or a certain person's fear or desires rather than their spirit or contrary to their spirit guides who generally know better what is good for the person than the person themselves does. It is of course very hard to hear for the person that their guides consider to them to be unready or unfit for working together with them or receiving their legacy, their powers. And this is often where things go bad. Because if people really have a very strong desire to work with their power, to have um, their complete instrumentarium at their fingertips, and the light side doesn't answer, and then usually the dark side will. <laughs> and um, trying to force your growth too quickly generally leads to people going to the dark side of the cosmos where the development of power is seen as spiritual progress by itself rather than a harmonious growth which in which the personality matures slightly more quickly than the power grows so that always the personality will be one step ahead of it and will be controlling the power then rather the opposite that the power will 
determine the actions because one of the risks is for a person with a hammer every problem looks like a nail and power tends to get overused and will thereby limit a person's scope because also the person will identify with the power will identify with the role the power is giving them with the position the power is giving them and then the person will be trapped in their own little golden cage where they are uh, the perfect master of this discipline, of this power, but ultimately they will be in a very narrow dead-end street, spiritually speaking. So, besides these um, lower powers, it is possible for a person to have a connection to the divine. Um, a connection to divine energies does not happen with everybody. Connections with power animals, guides and dream space should be there for every person. If a person has no divine connection, that can be just fine. It doesn't mean that there is something wrong with their crown chakra or something is missing from their crown chakra. It may simply be that they have uh, a life path where the guidance of their guides, of their dreams, and of their power animals will suffice. Also divine powers can always send messages through dreams if need be. It is not always necessary to have a contact with the waking consciousness as would be possible if there would be an active divine channel within the crown chakra. Another major function of the crown chakra is also morality. A person has two sets of morality. Uh, one set of morality is basically based in the throat chakra, where people are taught this is right, this is wrong, this is how children should behave, this is how men should behave, this is how women should behave. And this is a, a set which is basically imprinted upon the person. It's not so much a morality which is natural to the person. In the crown chakra, we actually found a person's natural morality, uh, which they have been developing over many lifetimes. And this morality structure can be more or less strong or more or less intrusive. And this generally gives a very good indication of how safe it is to trust the person. If the morality structure is overbearing, then the person will usually um, be dominated by it. They will have a set of rules, a set of directives and instructions which they will obey. So the person will become very blind, an instrument of some egregore or some other power which has programmed it to act as its minion. So the person is not actually in control of themselves, even though they may think so because they completely agree with their programming. They think their programming is the ultimate ideal, the ultimate definition of what is right or what is good. So these are very dangerous people. They're extremely uh, fundamentalist. They're also extremely inflexible. Um, so a very strong morality is not always a good thing because it's in a way blocks out all other impulses such as the heart, such as love, such as compassion. So a person might betray their own parents or their own children or even kill them to save them. And these things are usually signs of a very sick morality structure which is overbearing. To weaken morality structure is also a problem because all the lower centers are not controlled. Every desire is considered to be valid. So if you want to uh, steal or rape or be violent, well, that is fine. That is okay. It is just a part of you, part of your will. And you do not consider there to be a higher power. You don't consider there to exist any system of justice or morality and um, it is possible for a person to have no sense of morality 
and still to behave in a very good manner because of good karma. And for instance, for a person who is enlightened, this is often the case. They spend many lives, usually dozens of lifetimes, improving their karma, improving their habits, and so they will know how to act in the proper way. And they have no need for an external power to judge them or to teach them what is right or wrong anymore because they have already incorporated all the knowledge. So a person without morality is not by definition an evil person, but there are immoral people. They have no, um, no blockages, so they are capable of all behavior, but they not, might not have destructive patterns or harmful patterns at all. So a person like that, without morality, can be fine or they can be a very big threat. Just like a person with a lot of morality can be a very big threat. And in a way they are more dangerous. Because with a person who has a very strong morality, at least you know what they will do or how they will act. Because they have been programmed to act in a certain way, to think in a certain way. A person without morality is very free. It is a certain step also in spiritual development to rid yourself of your programming, of your limitations, to really allow yourself to explore yourself and to explore the cosmos, the universe around you without judgment, without fear, without apprehension. So, but if you take this step too quickly and release your morality before you're ready, and it's also very possible to fall prey to all these powers and currents which you might find yourself unable to control. So personally, I would not advise people to take this step to let go of their moral restraints before they have achieved or are very near to achieving a state of enlightenment. So then we come to the more or less safe patterns, people who have a more or less normal sense of morality. Um, there are differences, of course, how moral a person is, like is a person always saying the truth? Are they sometimes maybe cheating on their partners? Are they stealing? Are they willing to commit murder? And they're all different degrees to how far would a person go and under what circumstances. And ultimately, it is possible for a person to be unbreakable, morally unbreakable, that they would rather suffer the most horrible things themselves or even have their loved ones suffer through the most horrible things themselves without them being corrupted. And, but this is not usually the case. So if you're exploring this chakra, it's usually good to have a look at what is a person's limit. What would they need for them to break their morality? How strong is this structure? Will they buckle if physical violence is threatened? Or will they already buckle if their career or their reputation is threatened? Are they sensitive to changes in their um, state of luxury? Will money do it? Or want it? So, and what you will find is that the morality structure is really a filter. It is making a person open to certain types of guidance and not open to other types of guidance. So a morality structure is very similar to a self-initiation, that you're limiting your uh, the advice you hear to a specific part of the cosmos, which to you is considered to be right or good or an example to you. So morality structures usually show that the person has a goal, has a purpose, has a direction where they want to evolve into in their lives. So I'm usually not very worried if a person has, has any personality structure that they are completely lost spiritually because eventually the advice they're getting which is slanted towards a certain direction will also bring their thinking and their actions towards that direction and it doesn't matter how imperfect they are they're on a road towards that part of the cosmos towards that higher state of being and consciousness 
If however this morality structure has become very confused or there are opposing morality structures, then it can be a very big problem. So, but I'm already getting a little bit into the problems of the chakra rather than the function of the chakra. So I'll stop this video for now and go more to the details in the next one. Thank you for listening.